<coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'm not going to say anything about the weather. <laughs> I think we've covered it at this point. Uh, but uh, I was delighted when Val had asked me uh, if I could be part of this. Um, I've, I've, over the years, a former Yale football player, been very actively involved with the NCAA and college athletics. I'm very much an apostle of the value of college athletics and college experience. Uh, so for me, when I have an opportunity to talk with leaders such as the two gentlemen we're going to talk with today, uh, I always find it um, enlightening for me and hopefully enlightening for all of you too. The idea is, is we're going to have a, a conversation, as, as Val said, a, a look from the top. Um, with these university presidents, we'll talk about some big picture issues, and then we'll talk about some of the details that have to do specifically with the Big East. My hope is that towards the end, there will be some questions that you will all have generated from this conversation we're going to have. So um, feel free to, to start formulating some questions in your own mind. It makes it far less awkward for me when I say questions from the audience and everybody stares at me for a while. So you can start working on those questions if you will. Um, so we have uh, Father Dan Hendrickson, also Dr. Gabe Esteban here. Uh, to talk about those bigger pictures. So gentlemen, let's start. There, there are a number of specifics I do want to get to. But let's start with that big picture question. And, and, and that is sort of the state of the union observation, if you would. In terms of the state of intercollegiate athletics today, and Father Dan, since you're closest, I'll, I'll let you start. Good, I'd love to, love to start with this. And I want to thank uh, Jack for being here today and also Val and Stu for their tremendous leadership with the Big East. I've been at Creighton University for two years now. I came from Marquette and other institutions longer in the Big East than Creighton. I'm a trustee at Xavier University, so there's lots of interesting intersections here. With Even our if you schools. didn't have that collar on, there'd be somebody looking after you after all those, <laughs> that's after right. those involvements. But uh, the, the Big East has really performed very well in the last couple of years, and that's been, that's been exciting to, to embrace and be part of. Uh, from the, the perspective of the Office of the President, I think any of us are in our roles, and the people we work with, our colleagues in higher learning, is a student-first focus, and um, as we, we look at intercollegiate athletics right now, I think we, we get a, a bit concerned when we see um, legislation and different kind of efforts that want to compromise or, or lessen the, the um, descriptive element of the, the students who are athletes at our universities. And, and um, my institution, and, and but I know certainly the Big East institutions and Gabe and his leadership where he is, is we want to maintain the focus on the student and their experience and the, the education they're getting um, the values they learn for teamwork and time management and dedication, um, excellence not only on the court but also in the classrooms. Um, so we, we get a bit nervous when we, we see efforts to professionalize the student experience of our student athletes. And, um, I certainly I embrace the uh, the integrity of the, the folks where I am, the athletics department, my athletic director Bruce Rasmussen, our coaches, uh, Coach McDermott, the coaches of the other programs. Um, they're just so focused on the students and their experience as students, and that needs to be really important. Big East, I think, can be a leader in that. Gabe, how much? Uh, let me just again echo some of the things uh, Father Dan mentioned. Let me just add something else. Uh, I think if I look, if we were to look at intercollegiate athletics at this point in time, the only thing that's constant is the change, <laughs> which is being at times uh, imposed on us by external forces. Uh, among other things, and uh, it's difficult when you live in this uncertain environment. It's difficult to make planning and so on, and I think, again, the focus should be on the student athlete. At the end of the day, uh, we're here as a higher education institution. Should it, uh, should it, it should always be on the student, in this case, the student athlete. And anything that enhances that experience, uh, we're all going to be for. Anything that detracts or diminishes from that experience, especially the academic side, I think it's going to cause uh, concern on any of our campuses. Jack, let me let, let me add that uh, um, I returned to Creighton University just a couple of years ago as, in the role as president. I had been there about 18 years ago in the Department of Philosophy teaching. Um, it was in the classroom, and some of my best students were Creighton student athletes. They brought a sense of dedication and focus to their studies. It was just a delight to work with them. They were on time. Uh, they, they worked ahead of their schedule when they were in competition and off campus and out of town. But there was a Creighton, Creighton's continued to embrace that experience. I do want to talk in a, in a couple of minutes about the perceptions that you need to, to deal with uh, as university presidents, the perceptions of the performance of your student athletes as opposed to the reality. I'll get to that. But as, as university presidents, 
in a in a conference that has this long and rich rich and deep history, and that has in many ways defied what some people thought would happen to the Big East, and, and indeed has gone off on its own extraordinary arc since that time. I have to believe that, that at some point in your day, somebody comes to you, and it, it might be a alum, it, it, it might be a journalist, it might be somebody, who says, how can you preserve that academic integrity? <coughs> They're both marvelous institutions, Creighton and Seton Hall Marvelous academic reputations. Uh, their, their, their commitment to the community and, and their, their faith are important. So what would you say to you? And, and Gabe, I'll ask you this. If, if I come up to you and I say, I'm troubled. I, I'm troubled that people are going to look at Seton Hall University and say, okay, they won the tournament last year. They, they got into the NCAA tournament. They're both of you, by the way, both of their schools playing tonight in the semifinals, <laughs> which is a marvelous opportunity for them. And if I say to you, I, you know what, I, I, I'm troubled that this great success somehow has to be taking away, has to be diminishing our academic mission. What's your answer? Uh, I'd say it actually enhances some of our strongest uh, uh, academic performers are student athletes. If you look at their academic performance in terms of GPA, graduation rates, any academic metric you look at, they're going to be significantly higher than our average student at Seton Hall. I think one of the things you learn as a student athlete, and Jack, uh, I think you learned, is uh, the importance of self-discipline, the importance of being able to work with others, the importance of leadership, taking initiative. So those are all key elements uh, if you look at how to be successful at any university, at any job. So I think that's something which uh, is in view uh, on our students. And what's important to us also, for example, is the whole notion of student of uh, servant leadership. So we encourage our students uh, to be active in the community, we encourage them we have service learning requirements, among other things. Well, our student athletes are front and center when it comes to all of these things as well. We make it a point uh, uh, that they are engaged in the community at large. So I'd say it actually helps our academic uh, mission because they tend to be good role models uh, in general uh, for the rest of the campus. Father Dan, how about you? If I have that same comment to you, I'm, I'm, I'm an older alum and I say, look, I love Creighton, I love what it is, I love what it stands for, I'm concerned that people are going to think we're an athletic factory now. Gabe answered very well, and there's certainly a tremendous mission affinity between the, the ten institutions of the Big East, so we share lots of priorities in academics and certain leadership and community engagement. Our student athletes have an average of 3.34 GPA at our institution, which is remarkable. 93% uh, of them achieve graduation. Uh, 90, they're in the, they come to us in the 90th percentile of their college board examinations to begin with. So they're already high performing in their academics. Our student athletes in the course of their time at Creighton will perform something like in the course of one year, 6,000 hours of community service in the course of a given year, which is remarkable. They're in the north side of our city and the south side in different organizations like Habitat for Humanity. So if, if the perception from others is that, that we're not embracing something of the holistic experience of the student at, uh, at the college and higher learning, then we need to tell a better story. But I think if people will take a closer look, they see all these tremendous dimensions of academic success and community engagement and outreach. And also, for example, we talk about leadership. On my board right now are three former student athletes which is roughly 10% of our elected board. Uh, so two are former, former baseball players, another former basketball player. Uh, they have achieve a success in their own lives, in the business world, and so on. So if, and that's disproportionate to the, the percentage of our student athletes in the general population. Father Dan, you mentioned something interesting that I wanted to talk about, and that's the notion of perceptions. You know, there's an expression that is used often in the political world saying the expression, the, the perception very quickly becomes the reality in the minds of people. And if you look at the perceptions that people have about student athletes, um, I'll travel around the country and, and uh, I will talk about um, the NCAA and about intercollegiate athletics. And one of the things I routinely do is I say to my audience, somebody give me an idea. What do you think the graduation rate is across the board for Division I student athletes? And here's what I routinely get. 30%, 35%. Sometimes somebody becomes expansive and says 50%. And, 
And I say to them, across the board, the Visual Institute student athletes, something around 86%. Um, your Big East is 93%, which is, and, and these are astonishing numbers we're talking about. And then I'll say to them, all right, how about this? What do you think the graduation rate is for other students, non student athletes? And it flips. And they'll say 75%, 80%, 90%. I'll say, try this, try 65%. And literally, I will hear gasps somewhat, sometimes. Why, my first question to you is, why this perception? And then the follow-up question will be, what do we do about it? I, yeah, that, it's a good question. I would say that uh, oftentimes there's, a, there's an assumption that athletics, the divisions and departments of athletics operate as their own nation states within universities. That's not the case at Creighton University. And from what I'm learning with my colleagues here in the Big East, it's not the case with the nine other institutions, that these are, these are important to the fabric and the texture of the university. It's, the, the fan base is, is very well engaged with us. They know about our academic programs. They know about these expressions of community service. So I, I think it's the, uh, the, the integral dimension of athletics with the university, the cooperation in leadership with our students, with campus life. I think all of that works very well in our institutions. Why do we think, Kate, to you also, why is it then that when we talk about realities here, they are so very different from what the, the general public thinks about student athletes? Well, maybe part of it is that if anything goes wrong on the athletic side, the student athlete, when the student athlete is involved, it tends to be maybe magnified more so. Uh, because let's face it, uh, at a, lot, a number of institutions, they look at as models, so to speak. So they're, they're put on a pedestal to some degree, rightly or wrongly. So anytime anything even remotely goes wrong, then it's immediately focuses on them. Uh, when it's a, uh, some of our other students, I mean, the, the normal student who does uh, whatever they're supposed to do, whether they be business major or whatever, uh, you normally don't see that focus of attention. So I think that's, that's part of it. And sometimes we forget also that the same skills, again, I, to me, a student athlete requires a whole lot of discipline. It's no different than if you were a musician. Right? I mean, if, you, if you're part of your uh, school band or orchestra, or band, there's also a certain amount of discipline which is required. So I think those skill sets uh, are always transferable. And I think it's, the perception has to do with maybe a few incidents which have become quite publicized. I mean, you look at, and you mentioned my business and the journalism business, you know, you've heard the expression that people have when you talk about local news, especially if it leads, it leads, yeah. which means that's what the lead story is going to be. And I've been doing stories for 60 Minutes Sports for a while now, and we've been talking about how do we frame a story where we talk about the, the, the cases, Baylor, for instance. Now, that needs to be covered. It needs to be out there. But, you know, I, when, I, when you get to, uh, you know, I, I've hosted the NCAA Honors Gala for more than a decade now, and we give awards to 10 student athletes, and they are all astonishingly successful. Multiple athletic All-Americans, multiple academic All-Americans. Somebody in the meantime found a cure for cancer or something while they're doing all of the things that we're asking them to do, and you can't get those stories told. Why, why do you think there's such a resistance to tell the good stories? And this probably applies across the board for universities, but certainly in terms of um, student athletes. What do you think, Claudia? I, I would, I, you know, I think news can be sensationalized. We certainly see that in, in uh, different sectors of, of the way we live our lives. And, um, um, the bad press is, is good press or exciting press to a lot of folks, and it, it sells newspapers. Um, in my community, in my, my institution, we, we have routinely have 17,000 fans come to the CenturyLink to watch our basketball. We're the top five, probably, in the inter intercollegiate um, NCAA basketball. And we're kind of, we're the winter activity. And so, so if it's a 2 o'clock game on a Saturday afternoon or 8 p.m. on Thursday night or Tuesday night, we've got 17,000 people there. And so they're, they're, they're seeing some of the way we work and we act. But what's remarkable is that um, I think they recognize the, the integrity of our coaching and the values that uh, Coach McDermott offers the team, the teamwork that's, that's part of the, uh, the guys on the floor. Um, and, and the same on the women's court too. It's the, the great coaching there, and the, the way that the women work together. Um, so it's it's that that exposure is really very helpful to us. So, you know, if there's a, a hiccup or a stumble, I think the uh, the press likes to take off and run with it. Um, but there's a lot more to the story. 
and how exciting is it? I, I believe our Rhodes scholar from 10 years ago is a student athlete. Okay. Uh, another student athlete uh, got into Harvard Med School is now in Vanderbilt doing a residency. Uh, are those exciting stories to cover, so to speak, uh, from a media standpoint? Uh, well, not unless you won the Heisman Trophy, maybe, and become a Rhodes Scholar, doesn't become really exciting. But uh, and that's the thing, like you said, if it leads, it leads, so to speak. So there's also some, uh, I hate to say bias, but there's also uh, we realize what sells, uh, what, what stories sell, and this is not exactly exciting to see the success of your student athletes. We mentioned before the, the, the notion of the interaction, the athletic department, the university as a whole. And Father Danny talked about it and, and you know, also about being, you know, you wanted to be part of the fabric of the university as a whole. But here's my question. These athletic departments, and I'm not just talking about yours, but again, we're taking a big look across the collegiate athletics. These athletic departments have become essentially multi-million dollar corporations. That, uh, that operate within the structure of the university. Almost, if you want to use corporate terms, almost wholly owned subsidiaries of the university structure. I would think, never having been involved in it, that that has to create, uh, maybe tension is a stronger word, but it has to create a, a, a situation that needs to be navigated. So how do you, and again, I'll start with you, how do you as a university president deal with how, what, what the mission is, what the direction is, and what the pressures are on your athletic department, which could be very different from your philosophy department or your theater department. How do you deal with it? I work, I work very closely with, uh, with my athletic director and a lot of the personnel in the division, so we, we maintain a, a pretty remarkable transparency about the initiatives involved with athletics. Um, I'm, I'm well updated on different issues with expenses and revenue. Um, I, I'm, I'm well aware that um, if, if, there, if it seems to be lopsided, that athletics at my institution really enhances our sense of uh, who we are as an institution. It excites the alumni base around the nation. Stepping into the Big East just a couple of years ago, in some ways, um, integrated our, our our great nation on two different coasts, and we're in the center of the nation, and it brought us together in a very special way. So there's so much more exposure to, to who and what we are as a great university. And so the, the, the value add of athletics to us, um, or what it not only does for the, the education and the transformation of our student athletes, but also how it enhances the institution and, and our, our poise and posture in the national community has really been important. So, and, and again, I, I have great trust in the integrity of the, the folks that I'm working with, and the, the transparency has been remarkable and commendable. Okay, how about you? How do you deal with that? Yeah. Actually, one of the neat things is being able to work with our AD. Uh, we actually elevated uh, the position of the AD, and uh, our AD, Pat Lyons, is now Vice President, who sits on the Executive Committee of uh, basically my cabinet. Why is that important? Why was that important for you to do that? Well, it's important because it sends a message about uh, whether or not athletics has a role at the institution. And it also integrates it with the rest of the university. And I think where you see problems is when there's a misalignment between the mission of your athletic de department with the mission of the institution as a whole. And with us, athletics knows uh, uh, what their role is in helping fulfill our mission as, I mean, as a Catholic institution, so they're very well aligned with what we want to be able to accomplish, which is which is what uh, all of us in the Big East, at least, were very cognizant of that reality, that it has to be in line, otherwise why, why do it? And one of the things which Father Dan pointed out, which has become a great thing, is with our partnership, uh, now uh, the media partnership with Fox and everyone else, is that now we are able to have nationwide game watches, for example. We have we've expanded the number of alumni clubs across the country uh, because they can go to a bar or go to a place and just watch the game. So that's helped enhance the branding across the country as well. Mm -hmm. Gabe, I just want to add that, that I too brought um, my athletic director and the President's Council. That's been really helpful yeah. just to, to, keep, um, to keep athletics at, at the table in the conversation about the initiatives with the university. When, when my AD and with, when the coaches and with personnel and division are out talking, to so many of um, our supporters, our fans, a, a donor base, uh, they're not only telling the story of athletics, our needs for our, our capital projects and for scholarships, 
they're talking about uh, our academic initiatives as well, yeah. different buildings that enhance the whole campus environment. And you know what's neat is when we announced that we were setting up the med school, shortly after uh, I went to the athletic event. <laughs> and uh, first of all, athletic event, everyone was talking about the med school. Second piece is one of our coaches came up to me and said he was talking to the recruits about the medical school as well. <laughs> so I thought, okay, that's interesting. Academics is being used to sell a recruit uh, to the, uh, one of our uh, teams. Which, which is something that we would applaud, yeah. that we would like to see. Yeah, we've heard an expression, and fairly recently it's gotten a lot of play, and, and I want to get your reaction to it. The expression has been that athletics can be the front porch to the university. And I, I think, you, Nadia, you've probably heard that. And I've seen, quite candidly, I've seen some university presidents who have embraced that. And I've seen some university presidents who have, have maybe rebelled against it is too strong a term, but they certainly haven't embraced it. What do you both think about that concept of athletics can be a, a front porch to the university? Gabe, you want to start? Okay. Uh, in our case, it has and uh, probably will continue to be, in that it creates awareness for your brand. In our, I mean, if you want to use business terms, uh, our brand is the Secret Hall brand, and it has created an awareness. Uh, when we won the Big East Championship last year, two years ago when we beat uh, the Nova last second shot, uh, it was the, among the top five most tweeted things in the New York metro area. Uh, it made front page news uh, in, across the country, basically. So it does create awareness. I'm well aware that we have students uh, who heard of Seton Hall because of our basketball in this case. Uh, and it created top of mind awareness of, oh, uh, what is this institution? I won't agree. It's a, it's a good and happy image of my institution as well, that uh, athletics is the front porch of the institution. And, and again, the, the fan base for, for us is just really remarkable. It's loyal and supportive in good times and in bad. I mentioned just something a minute ago about the, the tremendous um, attendance we have, the 17,000 folks that come routinely to our home basketball games for the men. Uh, for, for men's soccer, I think we're top 10 in, uh, in NCAA attendance. And uh, same with baseball. And so it just creates tremendous exposure for Creek University as a Catholic and Jesuit institution for the values we have for our student athletes, for the personnel, and, and their um, accessibility, approachability, friendliness to uh, to our donor base and our, our fans. So it's a the, the loyalty is an important, and it, it just continues to bring more folks into the life of our institution. Let me talk about some things that are that are much more Big East centric, if you will. And, and Gabe, you were you were part of the conversations when the new Big East was being crafted. Give us a sense of, if you will, of, of when that was taking place, what the, what the primary concerns were about the, the transition from, from the other biggies, let's call it, into the present biggies. Uh, I'll say leap of faith. <laughs> uh, when we, were, when we, we had discussions about uh, transitioning, uh, we had felt that, at least some of us had felt that maybe uh, we had lost track of why the Big East was formed. It was formed as a basketball-centric conference and so on. And over time, that had obviously started to change a little bit uh, with uh, some of the changes in membership. So as we were transitioning, the question was, uh, okay, how do we transition in a way that we preserve what was uh, the basis for the Big East? Uh, and that was the key question. So we thought very carefully of who might make sense as partners uh, in the reconfigured communities. And we wanted institutions with similar values, uh, similar profiles, uh, and that was very important. And a side story, which I shared uh, uh, with some of you, Jack, earlier, is as we were meeting from December to uh, June, this is 12, 13, uh, we were meeting, for some reason, there were seven of us who were meeting uh, weekly, uh, at least weekly, there were seven of us, and there were only two non-priest presidents, me and Jack Roy at Georgetown. And for some reason, we were always meeting on Sundays. <laughs> so out of, uh, if you count the number of Sundays between December and June, I think there were probably three or four Sundays when we didn't meet. And I was thinking to myself, and I think I mentioned it to Jack, I said, Jack, uh, aren't priests supposed to be busy on Sundays? <laughs> uh, 
So, but uh, in, so some ways, ways, in some ways, a higher calling. Yeah, yeah, higher calling. Calling. Here, you get Sundays off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and question to you, then, Father Dan. You, you, two years at Creighton. Uh, Creighton came in in, in, in 2013. Um, you've been involved with other schools, but now you're the head of the university that's in this new Big East. What were your expectations coming in, and what, how have they been fulfilled now? Well, I want to say we're, we're just so grateful to stand with prestigious institutions like Seton Hall and the, the, with the, our institution, yours, the other eight in the Big East, because they're really remarkable um, places of higher learning with a lot of mission affinity. I think the, uh, the Big East competition for our student athletes has sharpened us and has quickened us, and we've also been able to kind of step up and push back a little bit. So we've, we've added a competitive edge in the, in the process. And it's, it's been exciting for our student athletes to, to step into a different arena and to, um, to embrace that and work with it. But our, our fan base, again, is just so thrilled about it. We're through the, we have, again, the loyalty is remarkable and notable. And I don't, I don't know how many hundreds of people we have here in New York City just in these, day alone, these days alone. And the, the, our folks are just so excited to, to be part of this nationalized competition network with these great institutions. One thing I want to add is that the neat thing about the Big East and all the conference institutes I'm familiar with is that we support each other. I mean, as long as we're not playing each other. <laughs> uh, but last year I remember as Villanova was making their title run, I kept sending texts and emails to Father Peter uh, as they were winning. Uh, but once we were uh, eliminated, it was all a matter of supporting each other uh, and thinking that uh, we want some of the Big East to be national champions. Special feel for it. Um, I could talk with these gentlemen forever. Unfortunately, we have some time constraints going on here, but we do have a couple minutes left. So my hope is somebody out here has a really great question or two um, that they might want to pose to either of, of the, the presidents. Come on, guys! I gave you a heads up. Let's go one over here. Get one over here. I'm Larissa Mazzani. I'm the academic. Uh, everyone knows me, Matt knows me, uh, I see them on a fairly regular basis on events. We actually honor our student athletes uh, who achieve a certain GPA at an event uh, which uh, is host hosted by my office and it's for uh, academic performance actually. So we try and make sure that uh, we're always trying to close that loop uh, with the different parts, academic side, athletic side and so on. And that's also why you have uh, Pat Lyons, who's our AD, within the uh, President's Cabinet. So he's kept aware of everything that goes on on campus, whether it be new programs, new this, new initiatives. So it's a small campus, just like Providence. It's a, it's a nice, cohesive campus. So it's not like we have 50,000 students. Uh, but uh, everyone knows me, and I know a whole lot of people on campus. So it's easy to make these uh, types of coordination. I'll, I'll just jump in quick with two images, actually. It's a great question, but I, I like to show up at the... See, it was a great question, after all. <laughs> <laughs> I like to go to practice and just to see them see them kind of in their, their routine. And um, I'm certainly at a lot of the events throughout the whole spectrum of our, our the big sports at Creighton University. Conversely, I hosted a, a panel presentation, a president's panel presentation on race relations this past October. And all the student athletes came to that. So it was just this great kind of reciprocity of uh, me being in their arena and uh, they're stepping into my arena. Let me do the last question here. And, and same question to both of you. you. You've got an extraordinary range of responsibilities in your position. What is it, when you look at this world, this intercollegiate world that we're talking about, what keeps you up at night? What, what makes you say, this is what I am most concerned about as we move forward. Do I have to start on that? Uh, you I've got a list. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
we, we, we have pretty complex jobs, and I, I'm certainly Gabe is, uh, is is seasoned and a bit more of an expert than myself. I'm, I'm in the role for two years. It's an honorable position, um, but you know, I certainly where it's a community. I, I have a community of about ten thousand folks, and it's it's like being a mayor of a, of a small city. We're worried about roads and buildings and constituents and civilians, all these these different kinds of initiatives with us. Um, so there, there's certainly lots of things. I, I, I certainly, if there's anything that, that compromises the student experience in some way, or when our students make mistakes, and they do, it's, a, it's wanting to step forward and address that pretty quickly, and, and just to, to, it's a learning environment and to keep moving forward productively and uh, positively. Other than the educational experience, it's always about student safety. Uh, because we've had, we've had one incident a number of years ago, so you realize that as a so-called mayor of a small city, about 10,000 also, uh, you're responsible for all these individuals. So the phone call I hate to be, get is the phone call at 2 in the morning. Uh, and uh, I think uh, all of us sleep with our phones next to us. And I have a personal phone which only very few people have access to. It's the phone which I turn on at night. And when that rings, it's never good. So you, you always worry about safety, safety, safety. Because that, without that, nothing else matters. Well, we wanted to, to start off with a view from the top here to give you a sense of some of the issues that are percolating, some of the ways that the presidents of these institutions have dealt with it. And I want to thank uh, Father Dan Hendrickson, Dr. Gabe Esteban for uh, sharing their time with us and, and most important, I think, sharing their thoughts and experiences with us. So for that, we thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Reverend Hedrickson and also Dr. Esteban and our moderator, uh, Jack Ford. Uh, I, I do want to mention and congratulate uh, both uh, Reverend Hedrickson and Dr. Esteban for making the semifinals of the uh, Big East Tournament uh, tonight. Um, I wish I could guarantee.